Okay, welcome everybody sitting. I filled the time. Uh, we have three speakers also uh, after the break. The, um, uh, we'll start, without further ado, uh, Dr. Chupu Mireya Okereke. Sorry if I mispronounced. No, you try actually. I've had a view of worse. <laughs> I can see in my hand there's always two dumbbells, so I seem to like that. Sorry about that. So the floor is yours uh, for the talk, 20 minutes, and then I'll, five minutes before we'll start signaling, and then half an hour, three times. That's the time. And, uh, do you want to sit? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the big chair. Yeah. My, my presentation is quite simple, straightforward, so hopefully I'm not going to even use um, all of my time, which I think is. It's good for conversation. What I want to do is to share with you uh, the results of uh, a project that I did with some colleagues at Brno University uh, last year, where we try to understand the incentive acting on uh, managers in the extractive industry in Nigeria the incentive acting on these managers to undertake uh, proactive environmental behavior. Uh, specifically, we wanted to weigh the relative impact of economic, institutional, and ethical factors in shaping uh, managerial perception towards uh, responsible environmental behavior. Researchers for a long time have always uh, investigated the factors that are shaping uh, managers' perception and companies' environmental uh, disposition <coughs> or behavior. Uh, they've looked at the role of uh, competitive dynamics, the, the role of organizational capability, the role of leadership, uh, the role of pressure from uh, NGOs, etc., uh, etc. Et and what we have as a framework for organizing this range of motives or incentives is a framework actually that categorizes them into three key, uh, uh, if you like, set of, uh, of factors. The first is the economic factors, uh, the second is the institutional factors, and the third is the ethical factor. And although there are a range of different uh, research that seeks to explore the impact of these various factors, we did not find any research that examines the relative weight of these three factors in a multivariate analysis. So we tried to fill that gap. Uh, but also there is a second motivation, which is that in literature there is a debate that is going on between uh, some people who suggest that uh, CSR, that is Corporate Social Responsibility, is nationally contingent. Matena Moon, for example, uh, cautions that we shouldn't be searching for these, uh, if you like, universal uh, forces that make managers to act in the way that they do, that the CSR of companies are local and nationally contingent. But also you have other research, uh, I think leading that part will be Bondi and Sparky, saying no, actually, the universalizing force of global capitalism means that managers all over the world are far more likely to behave in the same way uh, because they get acted upon by the same kind of uh, global capitalist forces and pressure. Why these researches have explored the source of dy uh, the, the, the dynamics in, in the West we didn't find any research that seeks to do that from the African context. And so we thought there was a gap there again. And particularly, uh, the gap is important as African begins to take a bit more active role in uh, global economic uh, uh, dynamics. 6% GDP growth over the past five years, much more than Japan, 0% in the past 10 years. Uh, but also, there's a a third uh, motivation, um, the increasing formulation of voluntary reporting initiative, global uh, GRI, Global Compact, the United uh, Commission on Human Rights of, the, of, of, of Companies, 
These sorts of initiatives are crafted at a global level. We're worried that they may have been crafted without a deep understanding of the uh, cultural uh, context in which they are supposed to function. And that actually then leads me to my title. Because when we began to survey the literature, we found that once a number, predominant number of research in the West, uh, suggests that the most important factor uh, acting on managers and companies to behave in an environmentally sustainable way are economically related economic factors. The main writers from an African context, Amesha and Alo, Visa and Co, find out, they suggest that the key motive uh, that is making managers to act in a responsible, socially responsible way is actually cultural. It has to do with this Ubuntu philosophy. Ubuntu is a term from East Africa that has to do with humanness or humanness, literally. You are because I am. We are because. So, so, so there is this connectivity, if you like, this uh, communitarian ethic that underlines the, the, the social relationship in Africa. And they argue that this is the main thing that is making uh, company managers to act uh, in a corporate, social, responsible way. But we're actually quite, we actually thought that quite slightly dubious. Because if uh, African managers have been prepared to act on the basis of their ethical convictions, uh, grounded in this Ubuntu philosophy, then you would expect that companies in Africa would be a lot more environmentally responsible. Because actually, when you look at the, let's see, let's see if I can find it. If, if you look at uh, this uh, pyramid by, by Caro, it suggests that uh, philanthropic or ethical motives uh, actually come well and um, way after economic and legal responsibilities. Uh, and so you start really by trying to do all you can to, uh, to get away with as much as you can, then you keep the law, but then you begin to be motivated by some more <laughs> sublime ethical responsibilities. If African managers are mainly influenced by humanness, by the Ubuntu philosophy, by this communitarian ethic, then why is it that African, uh, African managed uh, companies are not a lot more environmentally responsible than they are? We know from practice that there is a lot of pollution, environmental degradation, a lot of you, you know, Shell and some other and these companies that are in Africa. So we, we talk to go and find out what exactly is happening. And our research, I'm proud to say, actually, as far as I can see, um, is the research that has involved the largest number of uh, company managers in Africa. A lot of the previous research have been, you know, uh, uh, small end samples. They have their place, but we're worried that they may not be capturing what is uh, the practice. Let me kind of unpack these a little bit before I show you the result. And so I've already indicated that there are a wide range of factors that, you know, act on company managers to. Uh, behave in a particular way towards the environment. Um, I suggested that they can be categorized around those three key uh, uh, sets of factors. The theory of the firm says very simply that the main objective of business is business. Okay, and the champion is fired 1971. Business is would only engage in corporate social responsible action if it brings about profit. Simple. Now, let, don't understand that in a very narrow way, okay? Because the, the, the understanding of what makes a profit is quite broad within the theory. So it can be direct profit in terms of increasing resource efficiency and therefore uh, bringing about returns. But it can also be profit in an indirect way. So we get on well with the community where we, where in which uh, we are operating, and therefore. Our businesses are not destructed, and therefore we uh, maintain our profit margins. Now, that was for a long time the dominant theory of CSR, um, the, the, the motif driving CSR. 
Then Caro came and said, no, that's not actually the case. We should see companies as a multi-agent firm, not only interested in uh, profit, but also uh, being uh, ethically driven. Uh, and it is not only about uh, profit, it's also about the role of institution. So institutional theory seeks to understand the way in which the social cultural environment in which companies are acting or operating help to share the perception and the action of uh, companies and managers. By the way, notice that I use those two interchangeably because after all, um, companies are neutral entity, but the managers have, of course, moral values. And the moral values of these managers will translate into moral disposition, if you like, of the companies. And so, Carroll suggested that you know, um, institutional pressures are uh, uh, of extreme importance. We all quote DiMaggio, uh, who uh, unpacked this institutional pressure in three dimensions. The coercive, the mimetic, and the normative. The coercive mainly have to do with the rules of the game, the policies of the state. The mimetic has to do with the associations uh, that these company managers belong to, for example, the industrial association. And the normative has to do with kind of pressure from NGOs. The major argues that the coalition of these three forces uh, create what is called an organizational field, and that companies that are operating in a particular organizational field will be most likely to act in a particular way, leading to what they call isomorphism. As I've already indicated, uh, then we have the ethical theory that has to do with doing you know, right or wrong, uh, operating on the basis that uh, the theory of the firm, which is profit-oriented, all the institutions do not capture the wide range of motive that make companies to act. And that some companies uh, can be driven by purely the desire to do right, and I'm sure that I mean, this is not very simplistic because you have uh, companies here that are purely ethical, like body shop, but you know, they, well, 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 they, are, they are not for profit, but they are, they are not also for loss. Okay, so uh, we, we need to, to, to put that in balance. But surely there are companies that are not driven purely by, uh, <coughs> by pressure from NGOs or by competitive uh, uh, dynamics, but they really are there to. Um, to, to, to add value to society and are driven by particular ethical convictions. Now, this theory has been unpacked again to say that there are at least three key uh, motifs or pressures that can be gathered around ethics. One is the so-called stakeholder theory that says companies are owned not only by the shareholders but actually by the stakeholders and every decision that the company makes will have to accommodate the shareholders which have are bound to have various uh, impetus uh, and convictions. There is also the sustainable development uh, uh, dimension of the ethical theory, which says that you know, companies have to act in a way that leaves resources not just for this present uh, generation, but also for future generation. Uh, but in particular, and of course, for, there is also the right-based theory, which again casts uh, the, 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 uh, the ethics of companies' oppression in terms of human rights. And that's actually what underpins this new UN body on human rights of companies. But the one that relates very close to Ubuntu philosophy is the ethical theory about common good. That companies are not just uh, you know, fictitious entities, they are also citizens. The way that a human being or those of us are citizens would tend to act, not just about our, uh, you know, what, 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 uh, what is uh, in the best uh, uh, interest of, of our individual self and the collective interest. That is also the way that companies should act or does act. And so that's what leads to this Ubuntu philosophy of humanness, of culturalness, of communitarianism, of you know, this boundedness that we are together. And so we went and tested this, as I said, on 377 managers. Um, but don't ask me too many questions about this, <laughs> because it was done by my, my, my colleague from Brunel. But we constructed uh, this relationship that the, the responsible environmental behavior of companies can be explained by a combination of the economic, institutional, and ethical um, factors. And then there are also a number of other factors, but we try to separate them 
uh, to, to, to control for them because, because of gender, age, a managerial position, and experience, education, and income. In this uh, side that we're presenting, we've kind of uh, controlled for this because they know we are come too uh, close to the uh, institutional, economic, and ethical forces. Um, so based on that uh, 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 connecting equation, we tested and we, this is the result that we, we, we found. And very simply, what this result shows is that by far the most important factor acting on companies, managers in Africa, in Nigeria, are uh, uh, economic factors. We found that the Ubuntu philosophy or the, 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 the ethical factors have very, very little purchase in explaining why managers act the way they do. So, I hope that we will need all of those. Um, so, that, that really uh, leads us to why. Again, back to the theory, we argue, or the way we try to explain this, is that. It is not to say that there aren't cultural impetus or forces, or that managers are wholly unsensitive to these. But when managers find themselves managing a multinational company, they will have to follow the rules and regulations set by the company. And so managers are being influenced more by pressures from uh, the home companies. And we actually notice that there is a difference between the way that companies that are owned, for example, by the Netherlands versus the UK uh, versus the United States, showing that varieties of capitalism play a role here. But I don't have time to unpack it. So we notice that actually uh, globalization or global capitalism has spawned a transnational cadre of managers or managerial elites. The uh, value of which uh, is moved away from this Ubuntu communitarian philosophy that is African in nature, more to these uh, individualistic profit maximization ethics. And that is really the, uh, if you like, the, the key result. And therefore, we are able to question the Moon and Matan. Uh, uh, kind of uh, literature that is saying our uh, CSR is, is nationally contingent, is culturally cons contingent. Uh, the next step will actually be to do a lot more work to really tease out the relative weight of, of these um, in different contexts. Uh, but yes, Ubuntu appears to have been uh, killed and uh, academic hegemony appears to reign. Thank you. A nice closing sentence. <laughs> uh, the floor is open. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, contribution to the afternoon. Uh, let's open the floor to the. I will give preference to those who have not spoken <laughs> to this as a rule of the game here. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Jen Baca from LSE. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about who the managers are that you interviewed and were they Nigerians themselves or were they from? other cultural context where they maybe would not be familiar with the Ubuntu philosophy? Oh, I thought I actually found it somewhere. Managers from coal, uh, oil and gas, and mining minerals and metals. 52 con uh, companies in total, out of which we have 377. These are all Nigerian managers, but they're managing uh, mega multinational companies. And that's actually very important for three, at least three reasons, maybe four. First of all, the extractive industry uh, in Nigeria uh, contributes up to 40% of the GDP. So it, although this is not like uh, we haven't uh, taken a, a, a tour uh, through all the, the MN MNCs in, in Nigeria, but we feel that by focusing on the extractive industry, you get a powerful snapshot of what's going on here. Now, this is a second point. A lot of these MNCs are actually in joint ventures with the government. 
So if you want to know exactly the commitment of government in pushing through environmental reforms and promoting sustainability, these joint venture companies are the players to, to look. And totally, uh, these MNCs have hugely uh, social influence uh, because apart from uh, the government, they're employed by far the largest number of people. By the way, we also say that they have the ability uh, uh, for good and for bad. Uh, being global multinational companies, they can easily transport um, uh, the best technologies if they so wanted to Africa, but that also gives them the enormous opportunity to transport very bad technologies and appear that appears to be the way they're moving in the moment. You and then uh, you have I will ask this question and then you have spoken of mega preference. Sorry. And then we will come to the uh, Aurora, you will, please okay. say your name as well. Okay. So I'm Aurora from SOAS. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is to deal with what you just hinted on. The CSR policy or the environmental policies that companies follow within CSR is much dependent on national regulations of environment and which is the case in developing countries and that is why most of the industries who are multinational in nature they might have very different environmental practice in home countries but they have low levels of environmental practice in other countries where the environment regulation is not strong enough so if you could reflect on that and how does it influence the practice in Nigeria with visibility the regulation and the second question is that also environmental ethics um, to a great extent depends on the extended arm of the consumer. And as far as I understand Nigerian extractive industry, the consumers are not, lo not located within Nigeria because most of the resources are being transported outside. So could that be one of the reasons why CSR is less ethical or much far from the African you know, practice of Ubuntu and shifting more towards capitalist um, exploitation of resources because the consumers don't have a hand in how the resources can be used or even controlled. I don't know, I'd like to do a paper with you. <laughs> I would like to do a paper with you. Oh, because yeah. you, you, you present this thing so nice. <coughs> yeah, but you're right. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a bit of Ubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. Uh, about, about Pete here, uh, Freinas, uh, my, 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 Michael Blofield, uh, uh, Major Shop. Every research um, on CSR in developing countries makes this point that the weak institution, the weak policy framework, uh, is a major factor. And without that strong political, uh, sorry, policy framework, that companies are not actually gonna do uh, what they're supposed to do. An interesting research uh, compared about uh, 150 managers from South Africa and 150 managers from the US to check their uh, disposition towards the environment. And they found, interestingly, that managers from the US are more positively disposed to doing the right thing in environmentally pro uh, proactive behavior. And this report says that the major difference is the institutional factor. The managers in the US felt that the institutional context in which they operate meant that they had to be up on their game to do the right thing. Whereas the managers from South Africa didn't feel that they had that kind of constraint and pressure to act. So institutional factor is really really important. And that really ties into this idea of um, green consumerism. The idea that we don't have that sort of you know, green consumers in Africa that will bring pressure to bear on companies to behave in an ethical way. A new research that I have been doing actually looks at the Acoben rating project in Ghana to see the extent to which this voluntary reporting initiative in Ghana could act as an impetus to you know, uh, make companies to do the right thing. I found that the prospects of a voluntary rating um, program in Africa is very, very low, insofar as we do not have that critical mass of green consumers that will be saying, I will not buy from you if you do not play your part. 
Okay, we have one more question here, and then we have three questions for. Uh, um, yeah, yeah I, I was wondering if you can draw. Can you say your name, please? Oh, sorry, I'm Kun Berenson, I'm going to MC it. So. Uh, I was wondering if you controlled for where these managers are trained because there is of course this idea if you're trained in the West then you take Western values and you take them back home. So I was wondering if your research... I warned you clearly not to ask me questions on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but, um, no, but I think that's the right, the next step, okay? What we found was some relationship between the headquarters of these companies and the environmental disposition of the company and the managers. I suspect that that is a proxy for saying that there is, um, that where the managers train is a factor. If you assume that they've got their training, that they've been there for a long time and therefore got their training from the headquarters, but, you know, there was a connection between that, but that does not necessarily hold. It could be actually that the manager has a school in, in the UK, but they're now working in a US company or the Netherlands uh, owned company. Teasing out, if that can be done mathematically, teasing out the relative influence of the education, where the education was acquired, and whether there is any tension between that and the home company of those managers would be a very interesting thing. I suspect it would be difficult to really do to unpack that box. But, uh, but yes, it's, it will be an interesting thing to do. Then we'll have Phil O'Keefe, Peter Newell, and Jessica with I shall have three to, short interventions because we have exactly three minutes left. So I have in Nigeria frequently transposed to talk from examples on the ground of African managers in general because they're too much sophisticated. But when you look at Africa, anywhere north of the Sahel and certainly all the way down the southern African coast, it's largely Islamic. In your sample, or in your personal experience, is there a difference in senior management brought up in Islamic tradition from those brought up in Christian tradition, particularly with reference to the use of insurance for environmental management? Dear question. We'll collect the three, and then you'll have the last word. Yeah, it's just back to the um, previous conversation a little bit about where the, the norms about CSR come from and how you track that within the firm and you were saying you have to do it mathematically. Only one thing is to look at who's doing the training. I've done some training with companies before on CSR issues and it often comes from the home um, country basically. The, the owner of the company has a sort of CSR package or idea about things they think the whole company should know about and enroll particular consultants or people to come and give these sorts of training and therefore you would expect the diffusion effect to, to be very much steered towards the priorities of that country and I guess that's what I was going to ask about a little bit is did you find differences across those sectors in terms of where the company is based um, back also to the audience question about how who are, their main, who are they trying to use CSR tools for, who, which audiences are they trying to persuade because presumably depending on how globalised they are each of those sectors and companies within them would be organised very differently yeah, I'd just like to ask if you could elaborate a little bit on how you actually did the study and in particular how you in practice teased out whether the managers might have been likely to be influenced by Ubuntu or and the economic sort of decision making. Okay, <laughs> let me three no, yeah, yeah. I'll go in the reverse direction. So we distributed questionnaires. The questionnaires have about four different uh, sections. The first section, general questions about disposition. In the second section, we then begin to ask questions, some in direct uh, fashion, some in reverse coding, about you know um, to tease out economic factors. You know, for example, um, would you invest in this technology if it's going to cost your company money? Okay. Um, would you invest in this technology if uh, you think it's going to clean the air but it's going to reduce the profit margin? So questions both directly and indirectly in the second section to just gauge uh, the uh, economic, the, 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 the importance of economic factor. In the third section, we then ask questions about uh, institutional factors. Actually, we adapted now a little bit of uh, a scale that has already been used to publish uh, work. 
And this question you asked about, you know, what the influence of NGOs, the influence of you know regulation, the influence of uh, uh, organizations, you know, con uh, industrial organizations. And then in the last, we ask questions about ethics. So you know, do you believe in uh, in, in oneness? You know, would you believe in community or what's your sense <laughs> of? Uh, of, 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 of uh, this humanness of Ubuntu, would you still do something if, um, would you prefer to make profit uh, when, when, when it impacts on the environment? So we ask a lot of questions that test the ethics, and that's how we then record those, and then we analyze it based on the, uh, based on the, on the, on the equation. Uh, Pete's good question about training. The problem with this is that these are all multinational companies, if they are getting their training from local sources, then that's because they chose to do so. It's not because they cannot afford the best training in any part of the world. Shell, uh, ESCOM, BP Mobile, they should be cascading the best practices from the West to wherever their operations are. I find it abhorrent that no other country in the world plays more gas than Nigeria, okay? Whereas here and in the Netherlands, uh, gas flaring is banned. So what, 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 what makes the difference? It's the same management at the top level. So why don't you say that we're going to hold this same practice wherever we operate? So if they choose a very watered down, local specific, not up to date, or scratch training from the local people, that's because they choose this, not because they cannot afford the very best. Uh, but you're right, we need to kind of explore where they're getting their training, who's advising them, what is. So that's, I will actually see, even from this question, there's a number of different uh, directions that we can uh, take this research to. And that actually, I think, answers the question. No, we did not answer the question about religion. Um, but the managers, from, from my understanding, the managers that we, Peter, the managers that we uh, survey, comprises both Christian managers and, uh, and uh, Muslim managers. I would, however, say that trying to understand the extent, if any, the, the religion have any impact, will be an interesting uh, next step. Okay, thank you very much indeed, and a hand for our <laughs> Thank you for that look into the drivers of manager behavior. Uh, we often wonder in our department about the drivers of our manager's behavior. So <laughs> we should do something in that field. <laughs> Where would I train would be a good question. <laughs> Where do you learn new public management in the field of the world? Okay, maybe we shouldn't be too cynical. Um, the next speaker is Professor Katie Hamburg uh, from UCL. Yes, hello. So, Rosie asked me to talk about my research that's what I'm going to do environmental sustainable futures in East African rangelands. And what I want to do is look at five things. First of all, just very briefly, um, an overview of East African rangelands and community based conservation in those areas. I want to look quickly at the livelihoods of Maasai pastoralists who inhabit uh, one area of those rangelands. And then I want to look in a little bit more detail at one research project that we have looking at Tanzanian wildlife management areas, which are Tanzanian form of CDNRM, and a second project that we have looking at Kenya conservancies. And think about the implications for environmentally sustainable futures in those rangelands. So a very brief overview of East African rangelands. Everybody's familiar with the fact that these areas have tremendously spectacular savanna, large mammal wildlife. Um, that population of wildlife has been in drastic decline over the last 30 to 40 years. Kenya has lost between 50 and 80 percent of each of something like 45 different large mammal savanna species. Just during the three decades, 75 to 2005, that decline has continued up to the present day. It's very well documented. Tanzanian data less well documented, but it looks like there are similar declines happening. At the same time, these rangelands are the home of iconic pastoralist peoples like the Maasai, like the Turkana, like the Samburu. And those peoples are, if you like, the subject of numerous environmental degradation debates where governments and sometimes conservation organizations tend to see pastoralism as driving environmental degradation. Many 
independent researchers working in those areas don't see the evidence for that suggestion at all. Um, what nobody debates, though, is the fact that these populations are subject to persistent poverty. So working in this area, in four out of five sites, well over a thousand household surveys, um, four out of five sites, the average mean annual household income showed that individuals were living on less than a dollar a day. Kajado district in Kenya, 50% of the population living <coughs> below the rural poverty line of 50 cents, uh, 50 US cents per day. Nobody disputes that poverty is both wide and deep in these areas. And the third thing about these rain plans with respect to what we're talking about today, they are tremendous earners of revenue. So both Kenya and Tanzania currently get well over a billion dollars a year from Tourism, much of which is focused on these rangeland areas, on the savannah wildlife, on the pastoralist peoples there. Tourism is co top contributor to GDP in, in both of those countries. Tanzania is expected to earn uh, something like three billion US dollars um, in the next three three years, so building up to three billion dollars a year. And so many people, states, conservation organisations, business entrepreneurs, see this as a wonderful case for win-win community-based conservation. And I just want to very briefly show some results uh, from research that goes back 10 years looking at livelihoods of um, Maasai communities adjacent to a series of large protected areas or other conservation uh, interventions in, East, in, in these East African rangelands. So just to show you, we're talking about Kenya and Tanzania. The area I'm talking about as Maasai land straddles that border. It's about 150,000 square kilometers. And we looked. Um, at several hundred households in each of a series of communities around protected areas, so around the Maasai Mara, around Nairobi National Park, around Amboseli National Park, those three are in Kenya, and in Tanzania around Edumet Wildlife Management Area, <coughs> and around Tarangiri National Park. And what these pie charts show is just very simply the composition of um, mean annual household income. So if you start, just take quickly through this, if you start at 12 o'clock, and go around clockwise, that big area of black represents the proportion of household income that comes from livestock, from pastoralist enterprise. Moving on around clockwise, the pale grey area, proportion of household income, cash and in kind, that comes from cultivation. Um, moving on, the mid grey area, proportion of household income that comes from off-farm activity, people going to town working as night watchmen, working as sex workers, whatever it may be. And then you'll see there's a little sliver in mid grey which may not even show up terribly well. Sorry about that, uh, the chosen colours. That's the proportion of household income coming from wildlife conservation and tourism in these communities. And just to hammer home the point that you'll see that all, in all of these areas, on average, people are getting at least half, in some cases nearly three quarters of the income from livestock. Okay, so moving on to the ten years further down the line, we're now looking at these community-based conservation interventions that have been rolled out both in Tanzania and in Kenya. Tanzania is a country with a strong socialist history, still very strong central state control despite liberalization. And in Tanzania, community-based conservation is a national project. It's a national project with a national model of wildlife management areas which are rolled out according to a particular, very structured, very bureaucratic, quite complex pattern across the country. What this map shows you, in pale green, are the protected areas of Tanzania. So you've got more than 40% of land surface area dedicated to protected areas not allowing consumptive use by the local population. The mid-green areas are the sites of wildlife management areas. Several of them already established, and then these little ones, ones that are in the process now of being established. And we have a project funded by ESPA on the poverty impacts and also the ecosystem services impacts of those wildlife management areas. And I just want to, for the, I'm sure everyone knows this, but just to take you through the idea of CBNRO. So this is from a WWF USAID report published a couple of months ago on the status of wildlife management areas. The central idea of CBNRM is that when local communities have ownership of natural resources and derive significant benefits from the use of those resources, then the resources will be sustainably managed. This involves shifting control from the state to the community 
and developing opportunities for local residents to earn income from the resources newly under their control. I have to tell you, this is Orwellian stuff. You will see why. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. WMA objectives. To increase participation of local communities in the management of wildlife resources, to enable local communities to derive benefits from wildlife resources, and third and last, to enhance the conservation of wildlife resources. Now, I don't know how well this shows up. I just want to, because this project only started a few months ago, I don't have much of the results, but I want to tell you a little bit about one wildlife management area called Endomet. First of all, where is it? It's right up against the Tanzania-Kenya border. So this is Endomet, outlined in black. It's between Amboseli National Park, Kilimanjaro National Park, and Arusha Mount Mary National Park. And one of the reasons there's such intense pressure to establish this wildlife management area are these purple lines, which are migratory routes for wildlife, particularly mm -hmm. elephant. So you can see it enhances the connectivity for, from a conservation point of view. Now, apologies for this lower frame. But <coughs> this was a snapshot taken by Fred Nelson in the local government office of the, the kind of management plan, if you like. And what's important here, two things. First of all, you'll see there are something like nine villages. I won't go through them all, but nine villages all included in this wildlife management area. Secondly, I'm not sure if you can read here, but proposed wildlife management area, 110,000 hectares. Residents and agriculture, 11,000 hectares. So the idea is that you take a population for whom three quarters or, well, at least half, but probably three quarters of their livelihood or more comes from livestock and cultivation, and for whom less than 5% of their income comes from wildlife, and you get them to set aside 90% of their land. This is called giving control and opportunities to the local population. Well, the opportunities could be there if they get access to that tourist money, if tourists come. So let's look at that. <coughs> Tanzania has a very complex bureaucratic procedure, which I'm not going to go into, and broadly speaking, it's encapsulated in the fact that all of the revenues to wildlife management areas go first of all centrally to the state. Then they trickle down from the state to the district, then from the district to the wildlife management area, which is a group of several villages, then from the WMA to the villages themselves, and ultimately for the benefit of the households. At each of those stages, inefficiencies. At each of those stages, perfectly legitimate overhead. And at each of those stages, there are multiple different revenue streams, which are extremely complicated, given limited local accounting capacity and, indeed, literacy. Extremely complicated for people to manage. I'm not going to go into all of those different revenues, but just they are kind of summarized in these two colored frames. Revenues come either from game viewing or they come from hunting, okay? And anything that is in blue goes to the central government. Anything that's in green is the share that goes to the WMA, okay? So the central government retains 85% of the permit fee, which is the big earner. The WMA gets 80% or 75%, 85%, well, my must tell, sorry, 75% of the block fee, which is around 5,000 US dollars a year in this particular place. So, although I'm not giving you the results because I don't want to go through all the figures that we are trying to accumulate for all these different revenue streams, what you can see is that the WMA, just on the structural basis of how the revenues are meant to be dispersed, is getting far less than 50% of tourism revenues. Now, when that money arrives at the WMA, they again give about 50% of it to the village governments, the governments of each of the individual villages. That's a real problem, because some villages have put a huge amount of land in, been coerced to do so in many cases. Other villages have put only a small amount of land in, but all of them get equal shares. No matter what that does for social relations and community feeling. When the village government gets that money, it goes into community level initiatives, a significant proportion of which are to do with enforcement of the WMA. So it's kind of uh, Orwellian. Opportunity costs. Um, that's what we're interested in looking at is what are people giving up, what do they get in return. It is just possible that some people, or even the majority, are benefiting, but we think 
it's unlikely. So our research questions in this particular project are, what are the ecological outcomes of WMAs? And we have natural sciences colleagues looking at land cover change with remote sensing, looking at aerial censuses, counting wildlife and, and livestock, looking at, are you getting the conservation benefits that are assumed to follow on this change? And together with colleagues in Copenhagen, I'm looking at the social outcomes of WMA. So we're looking at institutional governance change at the level of the village and at the level of the WMA itself. And carrying out a very, very large number of household interviews with men and with women, looking at resource use histories and looking at how individual, looking at perceptions of, of change of individual well-being. I'm not going to go into the research design except to say we are trying really hard to make it qualitatively really rigorous and quantitatively and statistically really rigorous so that we can get very good causal attribution, so that we can really tie any differences that we find to WMAs or to other um, possible external factors. <coughs> Talking quickly about Kenya. Kenya, capitalist country, completely different political and economic history since independence, even before independence. <coughs> and the big difference in Kenya has been that rangelands, rather than really remaining under central control of the state, have, in Maasai land, largely been divided up into private areas. And let me just take you through that history so that you'll see the background of how this plays out as community-based conservation. In this upper frame, you've got the Kenya-Tanzania border there, that, that diamond line, and you've got the Maasai Mara game reserve here, which is Kenya's top earning tourist destination. And around that, you have a set of rangelands, and basically, in the decades, in a couple of decades following independence, those rangelands were divided up under, well, with a great deal of support and facilitation, you might even say coercion from the, from the World Bank, they're divided up into group ranches. So the idea is these are still kind of cooperative um, organisations. And basically, anybody who managed to get their name on the register of the group ranch had security of tenure. Unfortunately, as we know, these land programmes are very open to manipulation. And so a lot of people who should have got their names on group ranch registers didn't. And quite a lot of outsiders who had absolutely nothing to do with these group ranches did manage to get their names on. So that's one thing. Re membership registration was really problematic. Now, what then happened over the next couple of decades is that it became apparent that the chairman, the treasurer, and the secretary of many group branches, who were meant to be subject to elections every couple of years, actually stayed in post for 25 to 30 years. And during that period of time, they profited personally from the resources that belonged to the collective. So they were selling bits off, or they were annexing bits for their own personal use. And this drove a movement to privatise further and to divide this land up, divide this common uh, range land up into individual plots. So if you just look at that, Maasai Mara, and this is yeah, Koyaki and Yolkinye group ranches, this shows the individual allocations which people then fence and move to. Now when you fence this land, you undermine the possibility of mobility, which is vital to both livestock and to wildlife, driving declines in both. And so, over the last couple of decades, there has been pressure to form conservancies, to reverse fragmentation, and those conservancies pay a market rate to title holders. The people who own the land get a market rate. That sounds good. So, how does this work? We, we are interested in our, the, a project called Best Biodiversity, Ecosystem Services, Tipping Points in East African Rangelands, with modelling the environmental and social implications of these conservancies. Looking at the same sorts of things as for Tanzania, except here you have this pest income. Um, however, it creates some interesting effects, which I'm perfectly happy to answer questions on, in terms of gender, wealth, land ownership, as to who actually gets pests, who doesn't, who wins and who loses. So I'm going to skip that. I want to just move to one of the aspects of that work. It's my um, colleague Aidan Keane, who designed a very really neat set of economic games and choice experiments. And just to give you an illustration of the way that these things work and of 
the sorts of results that we're getting from that. I'm just going to talk you through this picture. So here you have a Maasai herd owner playing one of Abel's economic games. And you'll see he has in front of him a board that's divided up into different coloured areas. So this green area represents what's left of his private land that he hasn't set aside, he hasn't put it into conservancy. This, you can't really see it, this blue area, the blue area represents that part of his wealth which he has actually set aside into the conservancy, he's getting cash into it. So that's his cash reserve. And this red represents the national, uh, the Maasai Mara National Reserve, which is a protected area. And the blue counters represent what he's doing with his wealth, which can be either his money or his livestock. So you see, he put some of his livestock on his own land, and he's getting some of his wealth from conservation. But the majority of his livestock is grazing illegally in the national protected area. Because he's so squeezed, that's the only thing he can do. Right. Conservancies in Kenya are proliferating. 10% of land area and rising. In Tanzania, currently only 3%, but rising to 18% over the next couple of years. That's on top of the 40% already dedicated. People are really being squeezed. So, to conclude, CBNRM and CBC are really dominant narratives in the <coughs> landscape. They are seen by states, by conservation organizations, by tourism operators as the environmentally sustainable future. I think probably the alternative view would see it as a form of green grab, and bear in mind that that's taking place alongside land grab because these African arid and semi-arid lands and the water that in some cases runs through them or lives under them have become resources of tremendous value for the production of food and fuel and fibre um, for global markets. And states and foreign investors are moving in on that and there's a great deal of expropriation. So the positive message would be maybe the sorts of results that we're getting from this research gives some scope for nudging policy, for nudging practice, for raising awareness of, of the implications of these sorts of changes. But uh, I suppose the stronger message comes out just that the political ecology of these African rangelands builds on degradation discourses which are highly questionable, which I haven't gone into, but that's a whole lot of debate that they are driving processes which purport to be decentralization, but in fact, they're either re-centralization or they're accumulation by dispossession. Um, and that people respond by using the weapons of the weak to subvert the process. Uh, that's my colleagues for the one project, my colleagues for another project. And, ah, it's not letting me show you, I, I, oh, it's a nice picture of myself. Critical teaching on community-based land for resource management definitely haven't reached the, uh, the main players here yet. That uh, makes me a bit sad. Uh, but it is a very uh, interesting, even if Orwellian uh, case study. Uh, I'm sure there are many comments or questions to be asked. Please say your name. And, uh, Hi, I'm Amrita from SOAS. Thanks for your presentation. I'm really curious to know um, how does revenue from hunting come into this entire sphere of conservation area? Right. Of conservation. That's a really good question. Wildlife life of uh, that's, that's been happening since 1995 to 2005. So, so okay, how, so how, how, how does it come in? Because in truth, I don't think any of this is about conservation, it's about money. And tourist hunting is a phenomenal revenue earner for the Tanzanian government. There's an interesting contrast in that Kenya builds its presence, its international presence, as a non-hunting country. Tanzania builds its international presence as, you know, come here and hunt elephants. So, um, really, how does that fit in? Well, if you read, for example, um, Hassan Sashedina's work on Tarragoni National Park, he shows how the allocation of hunting permits is an extraordinarily corrupt process. And the wildlife division in Tanzania, I'm afraid, is, is renowned for levels of corruption unmatched anywhere else. And they sell at every level 
multiple versions of the same permit. So any quota system is, is a joke. Um, there are some species of, of wildlife that can very well support that sort of pressure, but there are some species, particularly the carnivores, particularly the elephants, I guess, that, that can't. So I don't know if that answers your question. It's about money. Uh, Fiona Noonan, University of Birmingham. Um, Fiona, you were it was a bit depressing, really, um, your case for the Liberal presence. Sorry, yes. <laughs> but, it is depressing. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but I mean, given that, you know, how much the CBNRM and the CBC have been critiqued, I mean, yes. largely because of interpretation, because obviously, you know, the law you were showing, you know, how could you possibly think that was community-based? Or, but, I mean, what can, what do you think, is there any hope, I mean, to sort of challenge the interpretation and misuse and those sort of practices? Is there any sort of opening in government? So I, I, well, I think that there is hope through nudging. I think that, that well, I, let me talk about the Marseille because these are people with whom or in whose areas I've worked for a long time and maybe I know them better than, than other groups. They, these are extremely sophisticated negotiators. In a country like Tanzania, they discovered that direct confrontation with the government over this sort of thing um, precipitated really horrible consequences. And as a result, they've become politically very sophisticated in, in showing that they want to work with the government, but also in making their case. In those circumstances, the more information that we can give people, and the more information that governments kind of have to accept as being scientifically rigorous, they like numbers, I'm afraid, um, the more that you can give that to the grassroots users, and the more you can give it to donors at the international community level, then hopefully the more you can squeeze corrupt organisations like the Division of Wildlife. So that, that would be my positive message. It may not be a very positive one, but it's like... We're all trying to help them. Evidence-based advocacy. Yes. Uh, who's next? Please Me. Um, okay, Francis Cleaver, King's College, yeah. Oh, well, I have two comments, actually. I thought the, um, I mean, I, I sort of agree with your analysis, and it is depressing, and, uh, but from my work in Tanzania, I just wonder if there's a missing element here, because I think that government planners would say that the community-based management model could work, or would work, but they base it on an assumption of, what they, of modern pastoralism. So they're assuming that um, pastoralists are also going to turn into modern pastoralists, only keeping one or two cattle and, um, you know, in, in this kind of model. So they're allocating land and so on on that basis. So it's a different model of pastoralism that they're allocating the land to. Certainly for the Osanga Plains, on that was the basis on which the land use planning was made. So, so I just think it's still still probably unviable, but it goes with the whole sort of capitalist production sort of model of things. Um, can, I, that, yeah, can I come back on yeah. that? Um, these are modern pastures. If you look at this, you'll find that for almost all these areas, after livestock production, the next most important thing is off-farm work. These people yeah. who are incredibly tightly integrated. Yeah. I highlighted night watchmen and sex workers, but many of these people are teachers. <laughs> and, you know, so th th this, this is a very diversified economy, but what works in arid and semi, semi arid rangeland is mobile pastoralism. Yeah, but you see that you can do modern pastoralism if you have the but, resources. But in Tanzania, the livestock, the livestock officials are doing that, and the land use planning, because I know this, because the land use planning they did for the Usanga resettlement was done on the basis of non-mobile pasture. And the model they were planning for, making the land use planning for, was for a, a form of pasturism that was non-mobile, where families would have, essentially there wouldn't be pasturists, there would be farms or, or, or diversified rural households with a few cattle. And that's what their community management would like. So I'm just raising a query about it is, mm. are there those assumptions underlying that allocation of land? You know, we talk about the same thing when we talk about pastoralism and they talk about pastoralism. In Tanzania, yeah, I know the, that was the assumption. The system that you're describing yeah. is if in you, some ways emerging in Kenya, yeah. where <clears> many <throat> Maasai are moving, from, and we've got the data not just from our own studies, yeah. but from area accounts and all sorts of, of different yeah. sources that support each other. 
people are moving away from capital and into small stock is yeah. the first thing. Secondly, people are to some extent reducing their, their capital numbers yeah. and moving to, as you yeah. say, semi-improved REITs, but you can only do that where the system allows you to access the vaccines that you need and the fodder that you need and the water development that you need, which I have to say, yeah. is absolutely not. But that is the model that the town is here. That is the model, that is the model it's set, yeah, not true. here. Not yeah. here. So I should have said this is this is a positive change, okay. is that in Endonet, just over the last couple of years, they have moved to say, well, maybe you can use this area for grazing. So they're opening up the set aside for grazing, however, the conditions under which that happens are not really clear, and the current capacity models that they apply are, are complex. I, I just raise it because you know, I just think that, sorry, sorry, I just think it's yeah. just part of the wider anti pastoralist kind of yeah, okay, uh, yeah, attitude of government. So, so it's not all just about, oh, let's pastoralist manage, you know, in a nice community way. It's like a part, partly the are all a bit backward and let's modernise and let's. Absolutely. I, I agree. Sorry. I agree completely. That there's a, an official. Uh, the two. I don't know if it's an official. It's our income largely by uh, labour migration. That, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Is the off farm income largely generated by labour migration? And, and it's, well, actually, uh, I'm afraid for the, this purpose, we rolled in together. Migration into the town, local trade, not livestock trade, which is wrapped up with livestock, but other forms of local trade, so a huge amount of local trade and petty vending and, and cross-border trade. Um, and we also put remittances in there, so it's, it's a bit of a capture. Because it doesn't have, have, have implications for the collapse of labour available to the on-farm there are issues around that which people seem to resolve through moving from, well, basically it's a wealth thing. So wealthier families, children get educated and they get jobs. Less wealthy families, people become higher herders and live very, very destitute lives. Last question. Thank you for the presentation. CBNRM has, I mean, it's a very insightful presentation, especially from the point of view of CBNRM. And my question was largely to do with the migratory communities because Tanzania is also known for a lot of migration from south to the north. And uh, I was wondering <coughs> how does that play out, especially with the privatization of land that you explained that happened, mm -hmm. where people were you know, creating their own boundaries on the basis of allocations that happened. Has there been a sense of conflict between the migratory communities who have moved into certain indigenous areas and how does that, that play out? Okay, so, so I think the short answer is yes, but not so much in this area. Here you're really still talking about a very strongly Maasai um, population. But as you go further south and further east, um, you get into situations where there are major clashes between mm -hmm. Maasai, Sukuma, various different uh, agricultural groups. And particularly um, where quite significant numbers of pastoralists have been displaced from land that's been given to uh, external investors. And, when, and I think that, that the estimates are that there are hundreds of thousands of people displaced by that process. And there is nowhere for them to go. And so inevitably you get conflict where they end up. So Rafiji would be a good example, and I think where Francis has been working in Usanga would be another example. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for uh, this excellent talk. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, my job is to try and talk about the politics of science and expertise. And of course, that's a huge topic. And what I try to do is to try and wrap that up into a general statement about science and expertise, but also in as far as it speaks to political ecology. I'm going to be kind of general, but I'm also hoping to cover various themes about what political ecology is and possibly what it should be doing, or possibly, at least that's a suggestion. And my main arguments are for these two things, which is first of all, if we're going to democratize or politicize expertise and, and science, 
then we have to look at the normative values within it. In other words, the, the, the public norms, social norms which are out there, shape the knowledge which becomes authoritative and then takes on the position as science and expertise, or indeed experts, if we're going to talk about the power of knowledge as, as something which directs the rest of political ecology. So in other words, we have to look at the normative value behind what makes um, expertise. Uh, now this is somewhat different from how a lot of books and people talk about expertise at the moment, which is essentially, you know, what, how do experts act? They're normally talking about people who have already been defined as experts and how they act in organisations like UNEP, for example, rather than understanding the more social basis of what is authoritative knowledge. So that's the first point. The second point I want to make is, is that political ecology, as I understand it, as I experience the terms, you know, in the sense of what I read on the internet and what hits me from emails, is that most people who talk about political ecology, usually from the US, don't yet get this. And therefore the challenge for political ecology, in my view, is whether political ecology as a sort of phrase is sufficiently nuanced to understand the relationships of science and politics or science and norms, rather than actually being a sort of a collective of basically greenies who want to argue against various things in today's society, people like Naomi Klein, for example. Um, so the, the issue there is partly a critique of how we do science and politics, but also a critique of how political ecology does political ecology. Okay, and this is my main point, which is, is that the usual challenge which I try to write about is the extent to which too much environmental policy or environmental debate is based upon essentialized and naturalized facts which reflect a whole bunch of norms, but these facts are then reproduced in ways to justify further norms without people realizing that the normative basis of these so-called facts. Now, of course, lots of people like Latour and others have said this sort of thing for years. And part of my critique is also to understand how political ecology has, has harnessed people like um, Latour, because I think that's part of the problem as well. So let's move on. Now, what I think the beginning point is, is the realization that ecology, as is often used within political ecology, has a normative history which people don't yet fully appreciate, which is that if you go back to the history of ecology, now if you go back to you know, the really early days of ecology, people like Townsend, I think it was, um, it's all based upon the idea of connectivity. But in the 1960s, coinciding with the interest in critical theory, Habermas and the like, you get all these ecologists like Eugene Odom and Paul B. Paul B. Sears talking about ecology as a subversive subject. In other words, that the very science is by definition subversive. Now, why is it? Basically because they saw it as an antidote to individualism. So this is a statement here. And by individualism, I mean a metaphor for economic behavior, a bit like what Chuck were talking about, you know, Ubuntu versus capitalism. I think this is this, which is basically the idea that individualism, economic rationality, <coughs> greed, not thinking about the common law, is this the root of problems in society. Now that's what people like Habermas and Her Herbert Marcuse wrote about from the critical theory of the 1960s. But people in the ecology world cottoned on to this and transferred this to the model of ecology. So essentially what you get is a, it's a, a merging of two broad areas of debate, which is first of all, the relationships of individuals to the society in general, plus the relationship of ecological processes in the sense of environmental or resource of animals relating to ecosystems, and its systems became essentially a metaphor for community, but I don't think this sort of thing has been made transparent enough. So when you look back at the history, you can see the overlaps there, but it's not just the dark ages of the 1960s, but it's also people like Al Gore, who, uh, whose book Earth in the Balance, I don't know if people have read it, but I think it's an awful book, um, is full of these sorts of statements which reproduce the sort of ideas of the 1960s. Now, of course, by me saying that Bala Gore's book in 1992 is awful doesn't suddenly put me in the camp of George Bush or, you know, all the climate change deniers, but I'm just trying to say that there's a history and context to the way in which people use ecology as a justification for politics, which is essentially normative, but in ways in which people generally don't understand. But if we're going to do ecology and politics better, we need to understand those things better, right? Now, what I'm now going to do is to review some of the ways in which political ecology has tried to deal with this. Now, the first, I would say, the first main big theory for dealing with this is something that Tony Allen 
holds very dear, cultural theory, which I, I think I'm putting up here because it's like the chapter one of how political ecology has dealt with this. So a lot of the work done in the 1980s and 1990s was influenced by this. Also, dare I say, Mike Hulme, who's a big name in climate change politics, is essentially a cultural theorist, I think. Um, whereas essentially, it's, I guess you all know this diagram, and I'm not going to waste time describing it, but it's, all, it's, it's this very simplistic model, clunky model, based upon the idea that there are two key criteria, grid and group. Grid is a willingness to follow rules. Group is a willingness to act with other people, right? So if you think about this as a, as a diagram, down here are people who don't like grids or groups. So these are equivalent to individualists. These are the uh, Idaho gun lobby people, if you like. They don't want the state telling them not to own a gun, that sort of thing. Whereas up here, you get the rule makers. They want to have rules for everybody. Okay, so in a sense, you know, if you want to run with this a bit more, this isn't Idaho anymore, this is like the Netherlands, perhaps. You know, and then you get other groups. The point is, is that out of this sort of clunky cultural theory comes a rather attractive classification. So this is Lester Brown, okay, he's obviously there. This is Jan Lomborg, okay, if you read Jan Lomborg, it's all about individualism and optimism. <coughs> if you read Lester Brown, it's all about limits and pessimism, right? Up here, you've got the state making rules of people, and in the top corner, uh, this is my symbol for a fatalist, uh, a woman African farmer, okay, a bit stereotypical, but the point is that it's meant to be a powerless person who can't act commonly because they're disempowered and uh, they just have to follow rules because they don't have any choice, okay. Now out of this comes this attractive sort of end result because I still see this happening today, I mean you still get this sort of debate going on, we've heard it today. So uh, these are the growth people, these are the degrowth people, right? Um, or what Peter was talking uh, about, I think about the coal, I thought was interesting, that lots of people, lot, when you read the, the green literature about climate change and energy, so many people slam coal, they want to see the end of coal. But the, the obvious point is, is that that's a very, very serious undertaking when so much of the world uses coal. You know, there's all sorts of ways in which you can look at these different voices fighting each other. Now, the point I'm trying to say here is, is that this is very much an attractive way of looking at expertise because out of all of these groups, um, they generate knowledge which they then authori you know, give authority to using their own social techniques. So all alliances of people quote Lester Brown as an authoritative voice. Similarly, Bjorn Lomborg is often trotted off as a, as a, a voice. <coughs> what I'm trying to say here is, is that the, the point of connecting <coughs> norms to science is to look more at the basis of doing this. Now, cultural theory, I think, is not sufficient because it tends to be so simplistic about these four voices, plus it doesn't do enough about uh, what to do if you have all these voices. The, the sort of people who push this, like Michael Thompson, basically say that if you acknowledge every voice is there, then it helps you understand why these voices emerge, which is great, but it doesn't exactly tell you what to do about a specific problem, like renewable energy, for example. But it is also useful for... It does have some things, which is that it is also a model for understanding how, not just how knowledge is shaped by different people, but how society shapes knowledge. And it struck me a couple of years ago when I saw a movie, which I'm sure some of you have seen, um, that there are so many ways in which society, especially society in the US, tends to reproduce knowledge in this way. So I'll give you that example. It's a little bit sad because there I was watching the Simpsons movie, thinking about cultural theory, but obviously Homer is an individualist, and the film writers put Lisa as an egalitarian, okay. She wants to protect the environment, so she creates a common property regime, yeah? This is Eleanor Ostrom to the rescue. Um, the common property regime doesn't work because the individualist breaks the rules, so the worst thing in the world happens, which is that the state intervenes, and the big state comes to the rescue but screws it up for all the fatalists who have to live with this, okay? So as a result, the solution to all this is regulate the individualists, okay? Now, the point is I'm trying to say here is, apart from the fact that I'm rather sad in thinking this, but um, is that this is a parable morality play in North America today. It's not so much that the environment expertise is like, you know, it's either individualism or fragility. But society itself is working through these different options. In this case, I think it's a story about the state. It basically says that if we can work together as communities, then we don't need a big state. Now that, I think, is a, is a morality play which works in the United States. 
you know, in today's environment. Now, the problem though with cultural theory from a sort of science and politics view is that it doesn't necessarily address or correct any of these views, but these views continue to have authority. Which I'm now shifting to, which is a more narrative-based, more sort of storyline-based approach. And I'm going to use Jared Diamond as an example because I, I never waste an opportunity just to show people quotations like this. What's so interesting about Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, is that it's so widely quoted. So many people with authority cite it as something that's very useful. I'm just reading Dreiseck's, Schlossberg's, and Norgard's book about climate challenge society. And within the first chapter, they're citing Jared Diamond as a source of authority. And what I find interesting is, is that probably most people read the first chapter, but they don't get to page 500. Because when it hits page 500, you get all these juicy quotations which look pretty ugly when you look at it in context, okay? Now, what I'm trying to say here is, 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 is first of all, the authority of Diamond as a spokesperson, which is expertise, yeah? But secondly, the way in which he makes these chains of cause and effect, <coughs> which he says up here is transparent connections, right? I would say quite the opposite, actually. Um, but nonetheless, he's actually making these sort of hard cause and effect statements within his stories about the world. And if that's not enough, then if you read on, then he comes up with these sorts of statements, which I find quite astounding that people don't hold into account more for this sort of stuff. But what I'm trying to say here is that all of these are examples of narratives. Okay? But also, it's an example of how cause and effect statements are put into nice black boxes and presented as authority in order to justify a political statement. Or, if you like, the political viewpoint justifies putting the facts together in this way. So just to be precise, this is blaming developing countries for AIDS and terrorism. And this is uh, saying horror of horrors, the only way we can deal with this is through military intervention. Right? There's nothing here, by the way, you'll notice, which is to do with um, aid or humanitarianism. Right? It's all the idea that you know, if we don't control these populations, then the only option is military assistance. Right? Right? Now, what I'm saying here is, is like, maybe it's because he's a bit out there. But also, I think probably it's more to do with this kind of position, in the same way as the Simpsons movie, marries together the various political mainstream views in the States, which is basically that it makes a lot more sense to speak to the egalitarians in this sort of crisis-driven way, rather than uh, to talk in terms of interventionism, which I think is uh, something that... Um, Jared Diamond or Paul Ehrlich, his friend, and other people, and Lester Brown, his other friend, don't necessarily want to do. So what I'm trying to drive at here are the, um, how do we deal with this? Now, in political ecology, there's been a great deal of deconstruction of narratives, um, stuff that I think I've done a little bit of myself, but other people, like Melissa Leach and other people, where we looked at um, all this sort of stuff. Now, my point is, is that it hasn't really worked. It hasn't had much influence. Now, a lot of the deconstruction of narratives is, for example, looking at, at these cause and effect statements and saying it's not really true, look at the evidence. But still the, the, the narratives keep on coming out. So I think one of the key things is the way in which the literature driving this sort of analysis hasn't transferred or hasn't really applied to the, if you like, the practical world of policy. So this is Bruno Latour, classic sort of Bruno Latour thing, um, where he basically makes a key point which is that, you know, we talk about nature and non-nature in nice convenient ways, you know, like you know, deforestation, arrows, genocide, yeah. Um, versus actually what really happened is this. Now what we need to ask is therefore, how do we get to that situation? And lots of people have done this sort of historical genealogy of narratives sort of stuff. But the trouble is, is that when you actually read the literature, people like Latour write in this sort of style, which you know, he's, he's a very brilliant man, but God, is he unusable. You know, it's, it's, um, it's not almost like, you know, it's, dare I say, I'm going to be rather assertive, but the ANT crowd, the Active Network Theory people, seem to write for themselves in very self-referential ways, using these theories, in ways which almost seem like to back off from actually engaging with people like the World Bank or engaging with people like Kevin Anderson who is the climate scientist at UEA who travels the world talking about imminent collapse and the need for degrowth. And I think there's this mismatch between, um, there's this mismatch between you know, the academic theories and then the world of development. And I think that's one of the, the key things. So I'm going to press on.
And I'm just going to pull that up as an example, a very particular type of narrative of desertification where this has been tried to be applied. But the question is, how do you do this? How do you actually make it work? How do you move from the world of a and and deconstruction? So what I'm asking here is, is, how do we do this more successfully? And this is what I'm trying to end on, which is the discussion of how to do this. Now, this is where I'm trying to use more debates now within science and technology studies, but without going down the road of verbose, trenchy type statements about, you know, <laughs> acts and never but instead of trying to, trying to deal with it. Any pressure? Which is essentially trying to deal with how do you implement this in policy? Now, I'm not trying to say there's an easy answer to this, but what I'm trying to do, generally, is um, work within this sort of framework. So, over here, we've got uh, the institution's approach, is basically the idea of trying to implement you know, a, a solution to a problem. Now, on this side, very nice people in all these groups, by the way, but Eleanor Ostrom has been the industry standard of applying, you know, so you get this sort of, I used to call it the, the Russian doll model of, you know, the, the global system connects to the national, connects to the village where it's all basically based upon ideas of regulating individualistic behavior, okay? But the attraction here is that it's all meant to be transferable and, you know, uh, everybody follows the rules. Over here, you have a more legally pluralist view, CBNRM, which is what Kath Homewood was telling us about. Um, and there's a great deal of stuff here. And then this is a middle ground where I think it's trying to connect more. I think maybe Francis Cleaver's work, but also Kath Homewood's work also fall into this sort of group. The idea of trying to connect the scales through a system of institutional bricolage or some kind of situation. Now what I'm trying to talk about more generally is if expertise is normatively based, the way to get better expertise which doesn't create the problems that we've been talking about is to try and localise it a bit more, try and feed in more development norms at the local level or to feed it up higher. I mean that's my question about Kath's work which is that you, you, you seem to be explaining in your talk, at least, um, all sorts of local dynamics about what, what's good and bad about these macro planning and local livelihoods, but the bigger question is what, how do we reform the planning process to incorporate those values? Now, I'm going to end on a, um, an example of how to do adaptation, because essentially that's what I think it's all about, the idea of how do you live with scarcity. And I recently came across a publication by the World Bank on ecosystem-based adaptation to climate change, which came up with this astounding statement that agriculture is one of the greatest threats to the natural ecosystems worldwide, which seems to be, uh, well, putting the cart before the horse. I mean, the point is that it's all about um, regulating the environment so that people can live, or regulating people so that they can live within the environment, rather than actually understanding that in places like Idaho or you know, Iowa, there's plenty of agriculture and plenty of prosperity. The question is how? Now, I'm talking about community-based adaptation as an example of how this may or may not work. So, as community-based adaptation to climate change, this is from Bangladesh, <coughs> there's so much work done now on very physical and obvious approaches to what people think is climate risk which I think is useful, and we shouldn't dismiss that it's, you know, we shouldn't say it's not useful, but it is kind of limited, which is things like this. These are called mock teeth. It's basically a device to make sure a household has got fresh water in the event of a flood, right? Kind of fundamental, but also very important. Another thing is raising the level of the house, okay? But this is what I'm trying to suggest is kind of obviously simplistic, because you're essentializing the risk and you're essentializing the response which is to say that the risk is rising sea level, therefore the response is, you know, protect against the rising sea level. A similar example is this. I took this photograph and people all of a sudden wanted to publish this photograph because it speaks to the narrative of sea level rise. Here we have a dry road in a village next to the ocean uh, and we have people raising the level of the road. And people are saying, oh brilliant, this is community-based adaptation because they're all raising the road. Now, unfortunately, for that story, this is what happens every year. Um, they do it in, in the dry season because that's what they do, it's a dry road, they've got to replace it. The real problem, apparently, with, with sea level rise is not so much that the water's rising, at least yet, but that this sort of water is turning salty, okay? But there's nothing in the magazines in the USA who wanted to publish this that wanted to talk about salinization rather than actually people getting their feet wet. And I think that's what I'm trying to say, is this sort of co-construction of risk and agency which is going on, which I think was, is what needs to be challenged within these institutions. 
But one of the problems we have is, is that the model of additionality within the Climate Change Convention, the idea that risk is reduced to just additional greenhouse gases, rather than risk as a result of social vulnerability, uh, means that, generally speaking, the mechanisms and the expertise doesn't focus on the local value. This is possibly one example, which is that in this particular place, people use this rice field. During the um, dry season, they grow rice uh, because the water is fresh, right? They, they eat that rice. During the wet season, it turns salty. So they put in baby crabs, and, they, and the crabs get big and fat, and then they sell the crabs to the local restaurant chain. Okay? Now, in a sense, that is an ex a very interesting livelihood adaptation, but it's not technically considered adaptation under the Climate Change Convention because it's not immediately linked to what the IPCC says will happen in terms of additional storms. Now, I don't want to diminish the, the need to protect against those storms because, after all, storms kill people. You know? But I'm also saying that I think what the, the, the challenge is to try and to increase the space for influencing these expert organizations to hear more about what's happening. So one possible way in which this is happening is through this organization, CCAPS, which is relatively new. This is part of the CGIAR, which is uh, focusing on how to do <laughs> mitigation and adaptation simultaneously with um, you know, food security and uh, ecosystem-based adaptation. Now, this is so far a new and interesting, but not very powerful bit of the climate change thing. But I think it's a good example, if you like, of what I think some of us have been talking about already today. So Jessica's talk about water as not just water. I think this is an interesting thing because it's talking about climate change risk, not just as what happens as a result of additional greenhouse gases, but essentially a, a locally informed way to increase resilience against those risks by focusing on livelihoods and food rather than simply within the framework of either its mitigation or adaptation to those gases. Um, this was something I think we talked about earlier, which I think I touched on in a, in a paper that's just come out, um, Peter's in that same edition, with the rather cheesy title, Climate Justice is Not Just Ice. Mm -hmm. The idea is that it's not just all about what's happening to the atmosphere, but it's about what, how people experience that. So my final point is, is that political ecology, generally speaking, seems to be full of people. The field called political ecology, if you go to the Dimensions of Political Ecology Conference in the US, it's full of people who basically locate themselves as, as egalitarians who want to fight against individualists. I think the basis of political ecology as a discipline is framed as an antidote to individualism. What people don't realize is that out of that framework comes a vision of what the risk is that we're facing and also a vision of agency to fight that risk, which I think is exclusionary. It doesn't take into account, in cultural theory terms, it doesn't take into account the fakerists. We're speaking on behalf of fakerists by saying things like, oh, you poor people, you've got so many more greenhouse gases to deal with. Let's, let us build you a sea wall, rather than actually understanding things like, well, let's get rid of your vulnerability to those gases. Now, a way ahead is to try and politicize those connections, make them more transparent, and try to make them more diverse. That's my view. Now, the, the question I'm wondering is, is political ecology, as it is currently discussed, the way to do that? Or is it a broader discussion of science and politics within environmental policy more generally, or within public policy? Uh, that's, that's part of what I'm dealing with. Anyway, I'll shut up. Thank you. Thank you. A very appropriate ending of the series of uh, talks, uh, questioning the whole concept, uh, idea rather, of political ecology. So here we are, starting the master's program in ecology. But of course, a very pertinent question. Uh, we have a few minutes left, five minutes, uh, for uh, some feedback and questioning of this, if you still have the stamina after this. Uh, but, but I'm sure this was invigorating. So. Uh, we actually had a debate in there, just to give you one and a half minute more to think. Uh, we had a debate when we started this, uh, discussing this initiative for a new master. Some of my colleagues suggested that perhaps political ecology was over its peak, and uh, I feel that was disappearing. Uh, well, I think we've seen it is not, but serious questions have to be asked about its focus and orientation. Uh, there were already two hands, but I've got which ones. Peter, you were, yeah. Thanks, Tim. That was, uh, that was great. I was just wondering, just on that final point, do you see 
and then beyond the CCAFs or uh, running compatible development or some of these things that are going on, do you see spaces for reflection and engagement on the part of elite expert communities? Like, are, is there an openness to hearing alternative narratives or accounts about how people understand risk, resilience, think about climate change? Or is there an element of them being locked into a particular way of presenting a narrative um, that, or that, an attachment to it that, that they can't move away from? Right, I feel a bit... Um, <clears throat> I feel rather strange saying this to you because you know so much more about it than I do. But my understanding of the Climate Change Convention is, is that it's already on the road towards us. And what we're getting is a sort of a hybrid situation of different modes of government. So like the 1997 Kyoto mode is all about fast mitigation using you know, uh, flexible finance to do that. Right now, we, you know, since about the, the Bali roadmap, I think 2007, I think we're in a situation where there are multiple routes to doing this. So red, for example, I think is, is dead in the sense that it was proposed in 2005. 2005 was flexible mechanism. <coughs> Investors get cash in return for mitigating carbon. Now it's like red, red has become an aid project. It's all about building capacity. I mean, you were saying earlier about the, um, the association of red projects with dodgy government strategies. I think the point is, is that it's already down that road. But this is not shared by everyone. I think you get multiple people. So UNDP is down this road, yeah. but World Resources Institute is not. Uh, and I think probably, probably to be fair, there's room for both approaches. Um, you know, I think that we should probably move down the road of having national targets which people try and follow. But at the same time, we certainly need to diversify carbon objectives away from just simply carbon. Uh, we need to diversify it into a broader definition of risk. So yeah, I think already people are moving down that road. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm Tony Allen, uh, formerly of SOAS, um, currently at King's. Um, uh, I'd like to ask you the question, why is it? Uh, I, I like the idea of political ecology as a simple way of looking at uh, <clears throat> the way we handle the environment being determined by power and political, political relations. But um, and then also the nice idea that the political economy, which is very powerful, and we've had giants projecting for 200 years, they were the wonders of political economy as an approach. Um, the, the, political, the political economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the political ecology. I don't know what you think. Just that sort of idea is helpful in, in trying to give some primacy to political ecology. Uh, I'm not at this point in life wanting to be a, a, a giant figure in political ecology, but you know, why is it that we haven't got any giants in political ecology? We've, got, we've had 200 years of giants in political economy, but why have we not got any giants that are automatically talking about <coughs> to political economy? This is meant to be, you know, I, I, I'm just wanting people to provide these ideas, these, this leadership, but I can't provide it in this. I've got lots of other things to do. Giants. Well, in order to answer that question, you've got to have a theory of who, what are giants and how they emerge, I guess. You know, when, when did um, Adam Smith when did Adam Smith become a giant? You know, I, I know literally when he did, but I mean, but at what point did, did his book suddenly become considered to be classic? You know. I think, I think it also partly depends on the, on the boundaries around the concept. I mean, um, in other words, it's too soon. Yeah. Well, possibly. I mean, what, what about Esther Bozerup? You know, I, I think Esther Bozerup, as a Danish woman, yeah, who wrote about adaptation, um, who also wrote Women's Role in Economic Development in 1970, yeah, um, possibly she's a candidate for centred within <laughs> environment and development, you know, but we're not there yet. I mean, it's, it's, it's a theory of how you get there. I don't know. But I would have thought that maybe she's up there as a potentially important person who could be then co-opted. I remember a million years ago when I was doing geography, there was this mini campaign to co-opt Darwin as a geographer. You know, so that, uh, like Darwin actually wrote a, a paper with the word physical geography in it. It was about worms. Uh, and uh, people were saying, oh, well, he's already, he's already de facto a geographer, you know, Darwin. Who is a giant, you know. So I think it's partly to do with the boundary politics around how you define political ecology. And I think probably over time people will either either redefine who are political ecologists or they'll redefine political ecology to include giants. But 
And if I may, can we, uh, Phil's point about what we really need is a political economy of the environment. Can we get that going? Because this sounds like a, a way in for us to get to a point where... Well, I think there's loads of work on political economy of the environment. Phil, Phil O'Keefe's work is a good example of that, possibly. But he's saying that it, it's more important than political ecology. Well, I would, I, would, I would agree with that, but I think it begs the, the point that, you know, <coughs> your, your discussion seems to be based upon putting words within fixed meanings, and I don't think that people attribute these meanings, these meanings very clearly. I mean, I don't think everybody agrees on what political ecology is. I think there are loads of people talking about the politics of environment, Al Gore for one, okay? But I don't think Al Gore talked about political ecology. And I think it's partly to do with, you know, the, the potency of certain words that they want to use. Exactly. I once lived in a university where political economy was basically equivalent to the notion of interdisciplinarity rather than anything else. So, words go everywhere. You want to Yes, thank you. Tim. I want. I wanted to ask a little bit about the cultural theory diagram. So I wanted to. I didn't get exactly whether you share this uh, this division of narratives or or you think it's limited. Because my take would be that uh, political ecology, precisely. I mean, the way I understand it. So we share our own experiences here now. But the way I understand it, precisely, tries to break with this type of division. Like exactly the argument I was trying to make with the growth is that. It's not the standard packaging of oh, it's uh, Lester Brown versus um, versus uh, Leonborg. You know, it's the limits to growth versus the neoclassical economist. I, I've, I've I've been trying to say that I, I don't feel very much common with Lester Brown. Maybe I have thirty percent common with him, but not <laughs> not more than that. So I think political ecology is exactly producing new political in the sense of different imaginaries of the world narratives that. Uh, they break, they break this packaging of this uh, two by two. So I wondered, what's your take on this by two? You think it, is, it captures more narratives, or were you criticizing it that it's uh, oversimplifying the, the plurality of narratives that exist? Um, well, Tony, you can say more than I will, but I'll take the liberty. Um, <laughs> I, I spend a lot of time talking <laughs> with my good friend Michael Thompson about this. I mean, he's a really good guy. Good guy. But the that the key point he would say is that this is constrained relativism. The idea is that if you imagine a, a diagram here with an X and a Y, and you get like a, a million dots representing people in society, each of these dots will be a different viewpoint. Some, somebody here is kind of similar to somebody here. But the way to make the point is just to simplify it and to sort of get some distance. So they end up with these rather stereotypical views in order to represent these sort of key positions. The idea is that you know not everybody in this position is going to be exactly like this and therefore exactly different to this, but you get these sort of transitions happening. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, so therefore, it is trying to demonstrate the importance of narratives, but by so doing, it, it makes a simplistic approach to, to narratives to do so, a deliberately simplistic approach to say this is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. So th their idea of environmental democratization is not simply watching these guys fight it out, but to appreciate that there are a number of views, some of which are more visible than others, like these people are not visible, unless they are seen through the lenses of the alliances with these people, these people. So all these, all these um, investors who say things like, the people of Tanzania want energy, we, we're bringing them energy, we're helping develop this sort of thing. It's basically them talking on behalf of them. So, in a sense, it's, I think it's a very positive thing because it's trying to show that truth claims are, you know, conditional, but at the same time, what is simplistic about this is its theory of how we get there. I think, I think as an observation of society, this is generally accurate. But as an explanation of how society works, it's awful. Okay, one last, uh, and we'll go for it. I suppose we have to start with Diamond, um, and the reintroduction of environmental determinism. Uh, in the early 20th century, it was very much based on the individual social freedom. You know, the black man was black, therefore he couldn't work. She was female, therefore she was not good for the middle class management. It just goes on. And it seems to me when I think back through the 20th century and the history of fights, it was winning the fight against environmental determinism that helped to allow other social struggles take place some 50, 60, 70 years later. 
And somebody said I was grumpy, a teacher. I'm not grumpy, I'm just sick of fighting the same fights again. And Diamond raised one with environmental determinism, which is very, very serious, because I can see a scenario in which any game made by feminism or any game made by the black man is simply lost if we lose the career. And I think it's so essential to talk about the norms of discourse between society and science. And one of the things about ecology is its prime objective is conservation. But do we conserve at the level of the gene, at the level of the species, or at the level of the ecotone? Come on, these have got entirely different meaning. We can have a few gardens, but it's not very useful to many people. Um, we can keep the koala bears alive. But that's not even for primary schools. You know, ecotones is what matters. So one of the bits we've got to keep very much alive, because political, political ecology is very rarely done in developed countries. It's like we've invented the science for development. And that is really serious, because simultaneous to that, we have said, oh yes, and it's too difficult to talk about pre-capitalist forms of production. What? Let me tell you one little quick story. Entirely by serendipity, I was involved in planning a series of 200 store projects in East Africa. Each store project was to do 200 stores. Each store project did precisely 200 stores. There were 201, 202. There was no diffusion. Each store used the same physical principles. <coughs> of radiation, convection, yeah? <coughs> that had to be addressed to improve the open fire. Right? So the first thing each stove maker did was to enclose the fire space. To cut a long story short, cooking takes place at dusk, into dark. And close a combustion space, you've got no light. What's the single most expensive form of energy to buy? Light. Why? Why didn't they spread? Because they were unable to identify that resource use in pre capitalist mode of production is multi purpose and simultaneous. And that makes it extremely different from a commodity and a capitalist. Trying to get technologies, you're quite right. Some of them are so simplified, it's not, not even worth addressing. But trying to deal with this idea that we've got a multi-purpose, simultaneous use of them has been very difficult. So I've had the greatest problem <coughs> with developing fuel wood trees. Because fuel wood is something that's there when the tree's got no further use. And it ceases to be a fruit tree, right? See? And nobody will take on the resource base of what pre-capitalist production, including how they use water. And it's absolutely fascinating. We've got the science for development, which is imposed from the first world, which will not seek to address the real use of resources by people in the third world and so on. And that's what makes me frustrated. Okay, thank you for that.